everyone and welcome to this session. We're not mic'd up in this session, so we're going to try very hard to project our voices um, so everyone can hear. But can we rely on you guys at the back? If you can't hear, just sort of a little wave so we can try and project our voices better. Um, so there's going to be 20 minutes talk for each and 10 minutes of questioning. <laughs> And first up is James Priest, who is a facilitator, trainer, consultant, and change maker. He supports communities, organizations, and indivi individuals to thrive, uses transformational tools such as nonviolent communication, way of counsel, inner voice dialogue, and the psychology of selves, and is part of a network of innovators collaborating towards the emergence of a more just, sustainable, and loving humanity. That's you. <laughs> and he's going to be talking about empowering transformational cooperation with Sociocracy 3.0. And I'm fascinated to know what Sociocracy 3.0 is. So over to you, James. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, so a couple of people have said, please, James, speak up. So if I get too quiet, would you remind me to speak up? And also, please, James speak slowly. So if I get excited and accelerate, would you please slow me down? Um, and if anything about my delivery is unbearable for you in some way and stands in the way of you engaging with this session, then please stop me, because I would rather we all arrive together at a point that we would wish to rather than leave half of you behind on the way. And also, could you stay in the middle bit? Because I can't see you. Sure, well, I could, except that I have to push the button because we don't have a clicker. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, is it possible, if you want to see me, maybe you can swap places here and then you can see me through this gap? You can turn it around the computer doesn't know which, it doesn't mind which way it's going. I could, but you know my eyes go double when I look to the left. <laughs> and it's much more comfortable for me to look to the right, so. If I may stand here, that would be great. Okay. So um, I want to introduce you to Sociopathy 3.0 today, and uh, I wonder before we begin, could you just raise your hand if you've ever heard of Sociopathy? Wow, that's such good news. Moralocracy. <laughs> and Holacracy, please raise your hands. Holacracy. Okay, so that gives me a sense. If you've never heard of Sociopathy before, would you also raise your hands, please? Okay, so in essence, Sociopathy by definition means Governance by the peers, companions, or social groups. Roughly translated, that means giving people who are invested around an area of work or creativity together the power to make the decisions about how they do that work within a range of tolerance and with respect for other people and other social groups around the environment and so on, within a range of tolerance of their needs also. So it's about distributing autonomy to groups of people, because usually the people who know best about how to do the work are the people who are doing the work. So sociocracy, governance, or rule-making, decision-making by the friends of social groups, with a heavy influence from the Quakers. So what I'm going to do today is give you a lightning presentation on sociocracy and sociocracy 3.0. Um, this is a high level, so we run two day, four day, one week introductions to sociocracy. So it's just to give you a flavour, and mainly what I want to do today is to share a perspective with you. To share or to awaken um, a point of view that actually we all have all of the time. And to show you how this today isn't about teaching you something, it's just about us remembering how we are an expression of life's longing for itself, and remembering that we, all of us, are functioning according to the universal principles by which life unfolds. This is kind of biomimicry into organizational governance and decision making. So 3.0, or S3 I would call it, is basically a framework and a set of principles that groups of people can use in order to facilitate the organic evolution of organization. It's also a framework for governance. When I say governance, I mean optimizing the flow of information that comes through each of us as individuals within the system 
to the places it needs to go so that we can optimise our effectiveness achieving what it is we want to achieve. And it has built into it a decision making process based on the principle of consent. So it's not mean version 3.0? Sorry? It's not 3.0 version. It is 3.0 version and I'll say briefly why as I go on with the presentation. So a decision making process based on the principle of consent. Consent is different to a lot of people's interpretation of consensus. And what we mean by consent is the absence of a reason not to. So what we're looking for in consent decision making is good enough for now, safe enough to try decisions, that we can then test see how it goes, learn from our experience, and then apply the learning through our real engagement to evolving, pivoting, and adapting how we do things. So that we can spend less time trying to create the perfect solution, and more time learning through engagement and discovering the emerging evolution of how to achieve the things that we want to achieve. So I'm not going to go into consent decision making today, but I wanted to share with you that that principle is underpinning this process. So, there's this emphasis on discovery in S3. It's a bit, if you imagine like the old paradigm, business planning, and groups of people would come together, they'd put together 50 pages, you know, with financial forecasts, SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, the business plan, and then after six months of planning it and a huge investment, they would then implement it and discover that 99% of what they'd anticipated was different, you know, <laughs> and then rewrite the whole thing, and then pay people to rewrite and keep reframing the whole thing so it looks like they're on track. Has anyone ever had an experience of that? Would you <laughs> okay. There's a few people here. These days, you've got this mean canvas. Yeah? It's like one pager. Approximately, who's your first customer? Where do you want to direct value initially? What's the first step you're going to take? Try it and then learn from the experience and then evolve your plan as you go. S3 is a framework to support the organic evolution of organization. And for more conscious collaboration, all I mean by that is 90% of the time, all of us are acting out of unconscious, habitual strategies. But we learn in our lives as our very best way to get our needs met in earlier moments of our life. When we come together as groups of people, we meet different ideologies, different ideas, different strategies. And what tends to happen in the absence of clarity, one around where we're going, and two around how to negotiate this diversity of perspective, is that we end up in some kind of polarisation with one. And we tend to seek out those people we feel alignment with and distance ourselves. Yeah, and if we're quite pluralistic, then in a very discreet way, quietly judge those people who do it differently to us. So when we talk about conscious collaboration, it's about stopping for a moment before acting and asking, what's actually going on here? What is it really that's here right now in the world? And what are the needs associated with this that we want to somehow flow things of value to? And if we can establish that, the actuality of what's happening, and the needs associated with it, then we have a place to align. And if we have a framework that helps us to embrace the diversity of perspectives and creativity of many individuals who have all had very different experiences in life and come with very different contributions to make, and we can find a way to tap that collective intelligence and arrive at decisions that reflect something beyond any one personal opinion, then we begin to discover decisions that are far more resilient, far more holistic, and far more likely to be effective in achieving what we want to achieve. You've heard this expression, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So this is a framework to facilitate the emergence of something greater than the sum of our individual parts. We really need this right now, as a species. You know, the time of radical individualism is fast coming to an end. We have to find ways to collaborate. We have to find ways to innovate new solutions to old problems so we don't keep doing what we've always done and keep getting what we've always got. I think it's valuable to mention that 
Interdependency can look so much like codependency. And many of us, myself included, are really terrified of engaging in some kind of codependent relation again because we've just started to find our own feet. We're just starting to get some sense of our own value, our own autonomy, our own kind of right to exist. And then we move into a collaboration with others who are standing for the same. And we lack adequate frameworks. We've got the will, we've got the longing to collaborate and co-create. But we bring all of this baggage with us. And suddenly it looks like, oh, you're trying to have power over me, or I want to have power over you. There's a very fine line between interdependency and codependency. And they look very similar, but they're radically different. And I think we stand at a moment in our history where we are invited to find ways to consciously collaborate together. Because without recognizing our interdependency, not just with one another, but with all life, yeah, then we face some serious consequences. This is why I spend my time sharing this. So this word, governance, yeah, it looks a bit like government. Yeah. Government is just a strategy we have as a species in many areas of the world to carry out the function of governance. It's just one way of doing it. We might find other ways of doing it in the future. I kind of hope so. <clears throat> but if you look at the definition of government, it's just to control, guide, or manage. And in S3, what we're focusing on is this question, what is it we want to control, guide, and manage? Well, what we want to control, guide, and manage is energy. It's like things that are of value. We want to flow value to needs in order to bring about changes to the situation that's before us. So governance, in essence, is just about finding ways to flow information to help us flow value <coughs> more effectively, reduce waste, yeah. optimize our energy. And what S3 is, basically, is a set of principles and patterns for doing this stuff, for helping us to guide and flow things that are of value in order to achieve the kind of outcomes we want to achieve. So I'm going to jump on just a little bit here, because we started a little late. <coughs> um, I'd invite you to check out Wikipedia, if you would like a history of sociocracy. Sociocracy, as a term, was coined in 1851 by August Comte. August Comte also termed the co coined the term sociology. I have some tensions around August Comte and some of his philosophies. But in essence, what he was pointing towards was this potential to move beyond the command control paradigm. God is beyond us and outside of us, and we must be subservient to some external force and rules to a place where we recognize more the inherent potential in each individual. And that if people have a sense of participation in creating the decisions that affect them and steering how to move, then they're going to be far more accountable for those decisions than if somebody makes them an imperative and enforces them upon them. So there's a great Wikipedia page. And S3 is simply a discovery that myself and some colleagues came up with earlier this year when we were looking at some of the tensions around classic sociocracy. And you can find out more about S3 via our website, and we'll make sure that there's uh, links available through the conference literature. Um, and S3, we've created Commons licensed it, We've just managed to access some funding, which we're delighted about, to develop more free resources. And what we wish to do is to be able to make this as available as possible to as many people as possible without obstruction. And I should just mention my dear friend Bernard Bottlebrink out of Berlin, because he and I have been working quite extensively on discovering this and finding ways to articulate it clearly. So, briefly then, in S3 we're navigating via tension. Paying attention to tensions. Inviting each person within a system to act like a nerve ending to the system, to pick up changes in the environment and feed that information back to the places where it would be most valuable. And if you look at tension, the times when we feel tension is when there's something about the current reality that is disconcordant with the kind of reality that we would prefer to see. 
we might see an opportunity and think, wow, if we optimize this opportunity, we can make change and that's going to be how I want it. Or we might see a threat and say, well, if we can reduce the threat, that's going to facilitate change and lead us towards a future we want to see. And there's a tendency to jump into ideas about the desired future reality and then as a group navigate towards creating the future reality we believe should be there. It's less common to stop for a moment and ask, well, what's the current reality? And what are the needs associated with that? Let's get clear on that before we start tripping on what kind of future we think we should create. So we say in S3 that organizations become driver-centric. And what a driver is, it's just a name we give to something that motivates us to act. Crocodiles didn't change much for a long time, because they didn't really feel very much tension. When you're a crocodile, there's not much to feel tense about, until human beings with guns came along. Now crocodiles tend to run away from human beings. But why evolve if you're hyper-resilient, you have no natural predators, yeah, and you can survive? Life pivots and adapts according to tension. So, driver is the name we give to something that motivates us to act, and an elegant way of defining it is with a single sentence statement that describes what's happening, and another sentence that describes the needs associated with it. So in the crocodile's case, there's this living thing coming with one of those sticks, yeah. I have a need for survival, I'm going to run away. Yeah. Strategy, run. It may have just been a stick and the crocodile was fine, yeah, but crocodiles can't necessarily assess the actuality. Okay, so a driver is central to everything. And what I'd like to do as the final part of this presentation is just to share with you this lens that I was talking about. Because if you understand this, you understand something about the foundations of how, in S3, we can navigate by attention. Because basically, in organization, we're going to come down in one of four ways to deal with any situation we face. We're either just going to do something, an action. We're going to make an agreement, or try to make an agreement together, in order to guide us in how we do things. We're going to give the job to somebody, create a role and give it to somebody to do or we're going to create a team of people to come together and figure out how to do it. This is how we address everything in organization. So if you bring in this lens, this filter, and ask the question, every time I'm feeling tense, what is it that's happening in the current reality? And what are the needs associated with that? Whether it's peace or profit, improved communication or joyfulness, broad scope of needs. What are the needs associated with it? And if we don't satisfy these needs, is this somehow going to mean that the value that's currently flowing to other needs that we've already agreed are important is going to be hindered somehow in its flow? If we see a reason why not responding to a new driver means that it's going to mean harm of life energy flowing to an existing driver, then, then we call this a new driver. And then sociocracy offers a number of patterns and processes for forming proposals together, making decisions that are good enough for now, safe enough to try, selecting people to roles on the basis of the reason for them to be there, not on the basis of the power or assumed power that they have, yeah, and constantly learning from our experience with regular feedback and evaluation to apply learning to each iteration of our decisions. I think I would leave it right there. And we can move into questions. Yeah, here and then refresh. Um, I'm part of Brighton Helen Culture Trust here mm -hmm. in the UK. And we're trying to restructure that organisation on a sociocratic model. Okay. Um, is this a, a furtherance of the original? Yes. Uh, and what are the significant differences? Okay, great. So what are the significant differences between the classic sociocracy yeah. and S3? Well, basically, it's how an organisation orientates. And so one of the tensions we discovered with the classic model is that groups of people 
orientate towards vision. They orientate to their dreamed of, desired future according to how they think it should be. And what we're seeing now emerging into the world with, with frameworks like Theory U, for example, is less um, clear for some of you, that's fine, but it's basically this recognition that there is a kind of inherent longing of life to unfold in certain ways. And that we are kind of stewards and custodians of that process. Yeah? And we have a big scope for creativity and a lot of scope for variation in how we do things. And yet also there is this kind of general direction that life is unfolding. And so the problem with, the potential problem with navigating towards a dreamed of desired future is that that dreamed of desired future may in no way reflect what the future needs to look like in order to satisfy the needs that motivated the action to begin with. Could you say that again? Sure. <laughs> yes, I will. The, the, the potential pitfall of navigating just towards vision without considering the source of the motivation to act to begin with could be that we collude together to create a future reality according to our fantasies of what might be best, regardless of whether or not that is accurately satisfying the needs that we saw a deficit that originally we were motivated to uh, fulfill. Yeah? So if you look behind anything, everything has a driver. Your question has a driver. My answer has a driver. The cameras have a driver. You being here has a driver. Yet there's a, things in the current reality that we all perceive, and we see needs, either our own or other people's, or the environments, or the world, spirit, and so on. And we're motivated to act in some way. This, we are need-satisfying creatures. This is what we do, always. And so what we're saying is, don't have an organization and discard vision. It's fine to have vision. It's fine to have an intended outcome in mind. Just don't get attached to the fact that it should look like that. Because you might find when you start satisfying the real needs, that actually what emerges is something different to what was anticipated. So if we're hooked on vision, then we might get rigid and resistant to change it. But if we're focused on the current reality and asking, are our endeavors bringing change to this current reality in the way that we would want? And is it fulfilling the needs or not? Then our strategy might change, and the consequences of our strategy might change. So vision can be far more flexible. We prefer to say intended outcome with regular review rather than vision. <laughs> Rakesh, you had a question? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you've more or less answered it. As okay. you know, I teach social oxygen 2.0, put it into practice. That's a nutshell. <laughs> and so my question is going to be, what was it about 2.0, that you know, what was the tension in 2.0 that led to the evolution of 3.0? Yeah. Why did it need to change? Well, it was a recognition that 3.0 isn't anything new, and it was running as a system underneath 2.0 anyway. Yeah, because we're all responding to satisfied drivers all the time. So we just said, let's make it explicit. We can take vision, mission, aim from the classic sociopathic structure and put it, it's a strategy, right? To have a vision, a mission, and an aim. Our strategy to meet these needs is to try and make the world look like this and do it approximately like this with these things. So it's not actually... You. you know, it's not a reorientation other than the fact that we're inviting people to look towards the needs that they want to satisfy. So are you saying you don't start with a vision mission? Or you just start with feeling what tensions there are in the group in yeah. order to act? Exactly. To start the and saying that all tension emerges because there's something discordant between the current reality and the future reality we might want to see. And if we just stop for a moment and take a look, <coughs> we always see there are needs associated with that. So it's kind of saying, let's become conscious of how life unfolds in each moment. When changes come and tensions arise, and optimize that and become conscious collaborators in the natural processes by which life unfolds. And it makes some difference also to how you qualify consent and objection, but that's for another, yeah. another day. So there was a question here. The, the okay. guy over there has said it's now the longest. Okay, so you and then you, and I think that will probably be all we have time for. Yeah. So, where have you uh, practiced and implemented this, and what was your experience with it? Um, well, we discovered it in December, 
we struggled for four months to articulate what we were discovering and then realized we were doing it in the process of trying to articulate it. Uh, we launched the website in March, and honestly it needs some updating at this point because we've been doing that in our own time. Um, and currently we're working with an organization that's represented here today and has 15,000 uh, employees. Um, it's viral interest in the agile community at this point, the IT sector, because they're already implementing a number of these principles into how you develop IT. Intentional communities, uh, social transformation groups, had conversations with transition panels, the mutual aid network, which is emerging in the US and new economy movements, um, some anarchist groups. We've just received about 90,000 euros from a European fund to develop these processes and work with a number of eco-villages, uh, eco-village movements in different countries in transition movement, which I don't want to say more about yet because we haven't formally announced that. So in the six months that we've been running with this publicly, it's been an extraordinary movement taking place. So there was a question here. So what you are saying is uh, that we to engage these uh, groups when we are going to take a decision is to live outside our expectations and to be open to what is happening uh, right now. Uh-huh. Uh, like forgetting a little our personal agendas. Uh-huh. And what, what difference is making this uh, all occasy? Because we are calling so sociocracy 3.0 <coughs> equal yeah. all It's the same thing. It's not the same thing. No. Because I saw in the arrow, in the diagram of the arrow. Yeah, like the yeah we took some of, some of the, the principles that Brian Robertson had been exploring with Polacracy. We were uh, encouraged by those and we considered those in the S3 framework. But this is not holacracy, this is very different to holacracy. And why did you mention it? What is the difference? What is the core difference? Um, well, because holacracy is based on the classic model of sociocracy. It was heavily influenced by it. Ah. Yeah, and there's a history there which you could find out a great deal about, but not through the wiki page, because there tends not to be the acknowledgement of the relationship between holacracy and sociocracy, yeah, unfortunately. And why we called it S3, Sociocracy 3.0, is just so people could track the lineage, because this is a 167-year history of evolution. And so from our point of view, it's important to acknowledge the ancestors. It's important to recognize those that came before, not to act like some rebellious teenager who begins all over again and loses nine-tenths of the wisdom of those who've already walked the journey. Yeah? So there's a, it's a difficult question to answer, but I've one final thing to wrap up. We don't leave our expectations and ideas at the door. We bring them all into the space. You know, what, what consent decision making gives us is a space where everyone can, affected by decisions can, is welcomed in sharing their opinions and ideas. But it offers us a framework to synthesize these various perspectives effectively to arrive at decisions that are within everyone's range of tolerance and where there's no further reason not to try it. So it's an inclusive process without one of the symptoms that we see often in consensus with unanimity processes, which is lengthy processes, yeah, decision making by endurance, yeah, and losing the emergent wisdom coming through the minority, because emergent wisdom always comes through the minority. Yeah. We need to listen to the new children as they come into our system. They bring the wisdom that we need in order to make the changes we want to see. So I think that's, I think that's really time. Yeah. Really great place. <laughs>
Glasgow and is co-creator of a local bioregion of West Argyll and the islands of Arran, Isla and Jura in Scotland. He's also involved in starting Transition Kintyre as a way of growing awareness of the bioregion and is, is in the process of setting up a community woodlands. And also speaking is Laurie Michaelis, is that That's the right. Very good. Um, who's coordinator at Living Witness, which is a Quaker charity supporting su sustainable living. Um, and prior to that, he's done all sorts of really impressive things, like <laughs> director of research at Oxford Commission on Sustainable Consumption, um, and what I found particularly interesting, um, author of several reports at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So, so Quaker meets permaculture. Well, welcome to this session. And I'm just going to briefly ask our people how many Quakers we have in the group today, you know, who would call themselves Quakers. Yep, so we've got a few. That's, that's great. Yep. So the reason I asked was because I thought of the idea of having this session almost a year ago because I found out that the IPC was going to be held at Friends House. Now, it's been renamed, for conference purposes, The Light, but it's actually at Friends House. And this is the, the place which we kind of call home as Britain Yearly Meeting. So Quakers, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute about Quakers, how they have a series of meetings that scale up from the local to the national. And this building in which we're at, we're in the small meeting house, small meeting room, and then there's the big meeting room, which is where the keynote speakers have been talking, and that is where we hold our gatherings, our annual gatherings, for the whole of Britain. So I thought, what a fantastic opportunity, because I've been a Quaker for 20 plus years, and I've also been a permaculturist for 20 plus years. And both communities kind of satisfy my needs, and I was interested in exploring how there is a synergy between Quakers and permaculture. So this is really the, what we're talking about today. But the, the, the essence, when Laurie and I discussed the, the, the essence of how we thought there was this synergy, is the fact that Quakers are a self-designing community. So we've been doing this for 360 years of self-designing. And we've, we've survived, we've evolved through that time. We've had ups and downs. We started on a huge up, which Laurie will maybe go and touch on, but we haven't really got much time, so I'm going to move on and get through the slides. <laughs> okay. Now, what strikes me looking at the two communities is that they both have very strong ethics and principles. Now the, the terminology, it might be called jargon, you know, for those who are inside and those who are outside and struggling to see what's going on inside, but we have very definite ethics and principles in the Quaker movement as the, the permaculture people do. So, yeah, I'm wearing two hats. <laughs> so here we go. So, you know, the common, the, the common to Quakers and permaculturists, and they're core and they're fundamental. It was really interesting hearing Jeff Lawson saying for Browning right the way through his talk the fact that it's all about ethics. You know, that permaculture is all about ethical behaviour towards the planet. And of course, our philosophy as Quakers is that it's ethical behaviour towards each other as people. So again, the, the systems kind of nest really well together. Okay. So we in the Quaker movement have our ethics and principles fundamentally as what we call our testimony. Now our testimony is all about right relationship. It's about the kind of relationship that James was going to earlier. You know, the, 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 the kind of building those kind of relationships between ourselves as human beings and as communities. And in order to do that, we have five... <laughs> yeah. uh, what I want to stress is that it is one testimony, okay? It is a, a, a right relationship with the world, 
with the rest of humanity and with the planet. So we are well known, if people ask what a Quaker is, they usually say it's something to do with peace. Because through the 20th century, we were you know, massively involved in the peace movement, in CND, in the campaigns of, of, with nuclear disarmament, uh, as peace activists. We were there on the front lines making our voices heard. Equality, sorry, got, yeah, just quickly just run through the others. Equality, again, Jeff Lawson was making a big play of that. You know, the whole issue of equality, and that is core to what we believe. As Quakers, we believe that everybody is equal. Everybody. And we strive to keep that equality going through evolving as a community, a worldwide community. Simplicity goes without saying, you know, Quakers have always been known for their non-material stance. In, in, 20, in our 21st century terms, we talk about it being non-materialistic. Truth, we are seekers after truth. In fact, that was probably the, the core testimony that really Quakers, people who were non-Quakers appreciated, because Quakers were trusted for their word. And I hope they still are. <laughs> Sustainability. That is a new one which Laurie's going to go into a lot, okay? Zone zero, zero. Okay, this is what really interesting. This is the kind of thing that really interested me about looking at Quakers and, and um, permaculture. Now, in permaculture, David Holmgren has his flower with his petals. One of the petals is all about health and spiritual well-being of the individual. He's saying that permaculture has a lot to offer there and that it's part of the permaculture movement. When David Holmgren published his book in 2004, which was referred to by, you know, by Rob Hopkins, it's a very seminal book, because he brought permaculture out of it being just to do with land and growing food on land. He said it's about a lot more than that. He said one of the petals, it was a whole flower, it was all about lots of different things, but one of the petals was very much about zone zero zero. And I know you all understand what that is because you're all permits, so that's okay. <laughs> in other words, it's not the zones that you're working on one to five out there in the environment. It's not even in the home where you live, which is zone zero, it's actually within you. It's zero zero, so it's going right in, into you as a person and your health and spiritual well-being. Now, Quakers, we do this, and Lloyd's going to mention a bit more about that in a minute. We listen inwardly to each other. We are open to transformation as a worshipping community. So we do it very collectively in a spiritual way. So, you know, we're, we, there's a slight, you know, this is interesting. I think the two can learn from each other. Okay, so that's like, yeah. I'm going to swap over now, and Laura's going to take. I'll, 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 I'll hold it. It's all right. I'll hold this. I'll do mine. Okay, he'll do it. Yeah. Right. So thanks, Ed. Um, so, oh, sorry. You oh yeah, was, that was just to show you that um, there is this pattern uh, of uh, uh, you know I mentioned yearly meeting, which is held every year here. Well, I'm part of my local meeting in Argyll, which is in West Scotland. Okay, so I'm a member, there is a local meeting, there is an area meeting which is West Scotland area meeting, so that holds place all the way up the west coast of Scotland, uniting all the small area meetings, there's only 10 people in my meeting, and 200, almost 200 miles away there's another meeting, but we have an area meeting to hold that space, to try and bring us together. Then we have a meeting for sufferings, which is a very interesting body, which is grown out of hardship and imprisonment, that's why it's called suffering, because when it was formed in the very early years of Quakerism, people were being thrown in jail for standing up and saying what I'm saying. Almost everybody, almost everybody was in prison. So anyway, the yearly meeting, meeting for sufferings was um, the, and still is, the kind of body that holds the space and, and makes the, tries to discern, as we say in, in Quakers, discern, work out, feel, you know, intuit collectively what, what the real concerns of yearly meeting are. 
And the yearly meeting is when we all gather, just like we're all gathering over these couple of days. So you can see it's actually a fractal pattern. It exhibits self-similarity all the way down. So if you go to a lunch yeah. meeting, it's like a big one. Okay? How, how are we for time? Oh, Nine minutes left. Right, okay. okay. So, yeah. um, sorry. Um, I want to talk about a bit more practically about what Quakers do and, and how, we, how we function um, uh, in three kind of nested senses, if you like. The first is our, what we call our meetings for worship. And one of the things about Quakers is um, we use quite a lot of archaic language, but we're probably about one of the most postmodern um, religions that you'll come across. Um, in that using words like worship, quite a lot of us, I think something like 20% of Quakers would call themselves atheists. Um, I tend to call myself a, um, an atheist Jewish Buddhist Quaker, so that, that could be some sense of where I'm coming from, possibly. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll say a bit about our decision-making process, and I think it's interesting in comparison with sociocracy. Um, and I'll say a bit about our engagement with the world and, and what Ed talked about as testimony. Our meetings, there are about 500, 480 meetings around the country. Um, basically, it's sitting together in stillness, um, listening inwardly and to each other, and both of those are key. Um, and... and this thing about being open to transformation is fundamental. And one of the... We have a little booklet. No, I can't see around in here. I can't see them. But that, that's got about... Has 42 what we call our advices and queries. And the first... That, that's the closest we've got to having a kind of... A really core text. Um, Quakers don't have a creed. We don't have a set set of beliefs. But we have got these things that we, we call our advices... And the first one is this, take heed to the promptings of love and truth in your hearts. Trust them as the leadings of God, and a lot of Quakers would say who's, whoever that might be, um, <laughs> whose light shows us our darkness and brings us to new life. So there's that element of the light is quite a strong image for Quakers. And phrases like standing still in the light, sitting in the light. Um, so there's this element of both listening and being open to being shown. In our meetings for worship, nobody leads. Anyone can speak, although we, we try to be quite careful about when we do speak. And you might get in a meeting where, if you, might, if you had, say, 30 people in a meeting, you might get maximum half a dozen in an hour people speaking. We've got this quite strong principle of answering that of God in everyone, and that's the, the core attitude to the way we listen to each other in meetings. So it's, it's even, if it, you know, even if your first reaction to what's being said is irritation, there's, there's quite a strong listening for what is this really saying to me? What, what's the meaning for me in what's being said? And that's that's quite an important model for how Quakers try and engage outside meeting for worship. So in a way, the meeting for worship is practising for relationships in the world. Um, very much about respecting others' journeys, so you're listening for what, what are other people saying about what they found, and having a sense of all conditions. This is, again, um, famous early Quaker George Fox talked about this, needing to have a sense of all conditions. Um, which he did quite a lot by getting thrown in prison and stuff like that. Um, and sometimes, through this careful listening in the meeting for worship, we get to a place which we call unity or being gathered. And I, I would call it a kind of collective consciousness. And really, that, that's kind of, for me, what's magic about Quakers. I think it's the one place I know where this really happens deliberately over and over again, this group creation of a, of a, of a collective consciousness. Um, 
Um, this for me is a key to, okay, you heard a little bit, I've, I've got a background in, in doing fairly mainstream climate change work and thinking about how change happens and so on. Um, I, for me, quakes are really interesting as a model for a different way of doing change. Um, so if you take the conventional view, which is, is top-down, government decides, I call it a machine metaphor, pull the levers, make the change happen. Um, that's number one. I think permaculture is obviously you know, way beyond that. There's a second one, which I would call an ecosystem metaphor, um, and which is about innovation, which is encouraging change, guiding change, um, competition, survival of the fittest. Um, this has actually got quite popular with government, this idea that you um, make a thousand flowers bloom and you nourish it and it's innovation systems and getting the framework right and getting the incentives right. Um, and it's bottom up, but there's also a top down or a, there's somebody doing the guiding. There's somebody deciding what the priorities are. And our model, and I think the model that, I, that permaculture aspires to, is actually it's not quite an ecosystem metaphor. It's actually something a bit different. Because it's a community of people in dialogue. It, it's my, my partner's a therapist and she talks about intersubjectivity. So it's actually a, it's a place where we are all part of deciding where we're going. Um, that's a picture from the Quaker community that I, I, I was part of. I mean, an intentional community in the Peak District um, for, for several years. Um, but it, 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 it's... It's really interesting how challenging it is um, trying to do this in, in real life, but that, that's what we, we are, are trying to do, is really be um, subjects together deciding where we're going. Our method for doing this, Quaker business method we call it, the decision-making method, um, it's a meeting for worship that agrees a minute. And producing a... a a, a text together is actually the key to how we do it. Um, I've talked about it, it's a process of seeking unity, which means um, we heard about consent. The, the Quaker discipline is very much one of letting go of our own positions and looking for what it is. Now, the archaic language is, is what's God's will for us. We talk about the sense of the meeting. Um, and it's finding a way forward together. Yes, I've said that. That takes us into an engagement with the world, and Ed talked about the testimonies, which are very often things that we're doing that are countercultural, equality and so on, but it's also about modelling. It's about being patterns and examples. Um, I'm going to skip this, um, except just saying that very often it's engaging the spirit of the world. Um, but we're very much about, about practice. And I would say Quakerism is it's an experimental religion, an experiential one and an experimental one. Um, we do a lot of work with conflict, and for example, um, I, I was in Bonn for the climate negotiations um, in June, um, doing, doing conflict work, basically. I've talked about the community I was part of, and that's kind of thing, and, and more generally, Quakers are engaged in supporting social change. Um, I need to skip this. Can I do lessons? Um, very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Um, what we find with this is... Certainly what I've said, my experience has been doing this work, especially on climate change, especially on sustainability. It's a very delicate balance of staying true to principles and letting go, because we're working with some of the 
particularly with sustainability, we're working with some of the hardest stuff for people. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. I'll, uh, at the same time, patience and trust. I found working with with Quakers that the change among us does happen, um, the changing lives and so on. Um, but there's a huge thing about actually, as I said, the intersubjectivity, letting other people choose for themselves and not trying to tell them what they need to do and allowing, allowing the, the change to arise from people. Um, and change arises, it does happen, it usually comes from unexpected places um, and in unexpected ways. Um, and I'm going to, we may have to stop. Well, I think, drop we, yeah. I think Maybe, we have any questions. Could yeah. read that. Well, if you leave that slide oh, up, sorry, so okay. you can read it while you're asking yeah. questions. It's, yeah. it's a thought I was going to ask Ray before in the last presentation. It occurs to me every time. It's, it's a thinking process before all these things. Where people come from in terms of thinking, you, know, you, can, you, can, think, you can say it in terms of can do, can't do, negative, positive. Unless they get the thinking right. It's beyond awareness, but it's like politics, isn't it? They're all sitting in a bubble, they're not thinking out with that. And it, it occurs everywhere, Deming's principles. It's about thinking first and Sorry. then developing it. Is there a question there? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> before all these, we want to establish the thinking process before all these things. That's the key, I think, how people think. I, don't, I would actually disagree with that. I, 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 think, I think changing the world actually, it doesn't matter how people think, and that's part of the Quaker thing, is we don't care what people believe. What actually matters is that we, is that, is that we actually act right. And people are not going to agree on the principles. <laughs> Essential to both the, the Quaker view, which I found really fascinating, uh, and permaculture is, um, would you say, with the ability to let go of self in I terms of um, permaculture design, in terms of discussing issues of social significance? Yeah? Absolutely fundamental. And um, I think with the Quaker process, it, it's for me, what's interesting about it is, is we practice the letting go of relationship in community, in, in either our relationships in the meeting, and I think that can then extend to a more universal, yes, so you know, ident co-identity. Yeah, I'd just like to say from the permaculture perspective, exactly the same, you know, because I noticed you mentioned that, you know, designing, and as a designer, as a permaculture designers. It's so important to let go, you know, when you're observing and looking at the landscape and, and engaging with other people who are maybe custodians of the landscape, you know, that you do have to let go and meet people where they are and really observe, deeply observe nature, you know, not from your point of view and what you want to do. And Pumpkin Cup's all about not doing anything <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> you might have answered my question already, but. Um I'm a member of a Quaker community that aspires to be a permaculture site. Oh, right. I was just wondering how your Quakerism has affected your permaculture and vice versa. So, well, yeah, I think that's, that's partly it. But um, there's a, there isn't another slide. I think it's a challenge. Well, these are challenges. Yes, collaboration. Yeah. Um, no, I think it, it, it is really what I've been saying. But, it, you know, the two really do feed. I guess what I, th what I originally thought was that Permaculture was all about being kind of outside and getting stuff done, you know, and, and action. And, and Quakers was all about kind of inward stuff. But actually, the two are really kind of crossed over. And in fact, you know, the more you go into permaculture, you realise it is about the inner stuff. And it is about how, you know, it's about perceptions and perspectives and how we relate to the world in a deep sense. And likewise, you know, so is, is, is Quakerism. So, yeah, I think there is an absolute fit, really, so you shouldn't have any problems. So, yeah, can I, actually, can I say a bit about... I think you proved my point that comment. Can I just right. say a bit about the, the community that I was part of in the Peak District? Um, 
it has about 11 acres of land which it, it manages more or less on permaculture principles or it aspires to permaculture principles. I think what's interesting is you've got quite a mix of different people there and some of them see their primary community as the people and you often get, you usually get one or two who see their primary community as the land and the ecosystem and it's quite interesting how that mixes and that, that work of of connecting the two and having them in balance, which is often very challenging. <laughs> um, this may be a slightly unfair question, but um, you said results sometimes come from unexpected places. I'd just love to hear an example mm. of something really unexpected. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, we put it out there, we've got to go. I don't think I can come up with anything really glaring. It's, it, it's just, you know, I've, I've had 15 years now of basically supporting Quakers in becoming more sustainable. And so running workshops for Quakers and going around the country and doing, doing work with local meetings. And it really is just that you come across people that you haven't he heard of that have set up a group. and um, Or you come across people who said, I've, you know, since you spoke... 15 years ago I've become vegan and stopped flying and that kind of you, it's just more uh, and you find it, I have found it's really important for me to step back that, that you know initially I did quite a lot of trying to lead and push and it, it's actually when I for example my meeting in Oxford it's when I went away for four years to live in this community I came back and they'd you know they'd insulated the buildings and done all so there, there's this kind of thing of very often it's when you're pushing other people don't do anything. If you let go and stand back, yeah. very often that's when, when other people <coughs> take the initiative. That's very yeah, true. There was a lady at the back. Do you still want to ask a question? Um, it has to be quite quick. Okay, as a Quaker permaculturist, I came to Quakers because of the testimonies to live your life according to peace, simplicity, and dignity community. Yeah. They made a huge difference. Also, the fact you can discern through a meeting and concern. However, I've had very little about the everyday applications of many of these. And then I, when I came to permaculture, I was able to marry the two. So I have my, my Quaker testimonies combined with permaculture, both the people and the earth, and I found a very comfortable relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've just spent a week back at my community in the Peak District facilitating conflict and relationship building stuff. And it can be very difficult where you've got people who aren't, aren't prepared to. But at the same time, we need the mix of people. So we need the very practical people who maybe aren't so comfortable doing that. Um, and I think, I, I wouldn't say it's a prerequisite. But I think, I think it's just a huge amount of work of building mutual understanding between people. I don't think there are any prerequisites. I'm, I mean, answering that of God in everyone, that principle, says actually we need to, we need to be able to bring everyone in. Um, but it, it can be hard work. And just by setting examples, like Andy, is it very interesting how Andy used the term pause? He didn't want to talk about a silence, you know, but he, yeah. he's, Andy's very tuned in, Andy Goldring, you know, at the very beginning, was most people there. Yeah. You know, he, he said, before we start, let's have a wee pause. And, uh, I'm sorry, I'm using the Scottish term, we, a wee pause. <laughs> you know, making it even more, you know, kind of, you know, but it's very interesting how he used the word pause because he maybe felt silence was a bit scary. <laughs> so I think it's, it's a matter of enjoining and, and sort of inviting people, as Rob Hopkins would say, inviting people to try it, you know, to do a little bit of inner tasting, you know, and see how it feels. Okay, well, 
abstract I was kind of drawn to this idea of community building but you know things emerged and things evolved in the meantime so I kind of renamed it it's just a story about about cell really and the story of the chaos um, which I'm going to explain in a minute <coughs> to me was interesting because it's kind of a, a good scaffolding to kind of tell the story and maybe um, after these you know two inspiring talks um, my main uh, message perhaps uh, is to you know let's think about our organizations and how they work and how we can you know apply this to our own living and working context um, and yeah so SAL is this this uh, organization that I'm going to talk about and um, I'm also very much also perhaps because of my background and my biases and whatever um, a strong believer in um, the, the 21st century will be what it is uh, because, of, because of how we conceptualize what it means to be human and how we can expand that and uh, to include you know, other beings uh, in our compassion. So basically, when I, uh, yeah, when, I, when I was thinking about this, I, I came across this idea of chaotic organization, which is uh, a concept that comes from organizational management and corporate culture. Um, and so, basically, this is the kind of most fundamental definition that you will find. Uh, it's an enterprise in which the two most fundamental properties of reality, so chaos and order, are maintained in dynamical balance by virtue of an intentional process of management. And yeah, being kind of from a culturalist, you kind of think management, ooh, that's a kind of strange word. So, um, yeah, I would kind of rather use the, the idea of governance because it's more, you know, it has more this idea of pulse, you know, like I think about a river that kind of in arid, in arid uh, biomes perhaps kind of has a, a, flow, a flow of season and then perhaps no flow in, in another season. So basically, I would kind of replace that with, with governance and kind of say that it's, it's something that we can use to think about how much order do we need in our, in our organizations and how much chaos can we actually support while, while moving, along, moving along. Because I guess, um, um, yeah, th there's new ways of thinking about organization that are perhaps very fruitful to us. And so and these are the properties that are usually associated with this idea of chaotic organization, and they come from, from uh, biology and from things like that. And basically, chaotic organization, and I need to come clean about this as well, is, uh, it comes from somebody called D. Hock. Have you heard of him? D. Huck, yeah? Do you know who he is? Yep. Yeah? Founder of Visa. Yeah, <laughs> great. Brilliant, uh, brilliant, brilliant guy. Who, he's a really, really brilliant guy. So already in the 70s, he was thinking about command and control stuff, really didn't work for corporate anymore. And he was trying to think about different ways of conceptualizing power structures and distributing power, distributing ownership, and things like that in, in Visa, you know, paradox of, of our time. And um, basically, he also left Visa to become a farmer in the end. <laughs> um, it's like, and so he basically came up with these uh, properties that uh, you can associate with uh, living systems as they evolve through time. So one is discontinuous growth, organizational consciousness, connectivity, flexibility, continuous transformation, and self-organization. Um, this is part of a larger paper, but I'm going to just touch on a few of them in relation to self today. 
Um, yeah, so when I, when I was thinking about founding, founding Cell, I was very much interested in this kind of difference between mechanistic systems and living systems and how to, this, what, what does it actually mean to design an organization as a living system? <laughs> and this is, a, you probably might have seen this, uh, it's from the high age of automata in the 18th century when people were kind of really getting into this, wow, machines and stuff, this is really cool. And, and they made this, uh, there was this French guy who made this digesting duck. Duck didn't really digest, but it was a machine that kind of produced some pieces at the end, which uh, is interesting. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, that, that's kind of one of my questions. And I think that's also a question that, of course, I haven't answered, but it is a question that is driving um, organiz organizations that, that maybe look at things differently. And, and then actually, this is kind of a very complicated question, but um, basically, what does that actually mean in practice? How do we actually do this? You know, and how do, do we actually create something that is itself something very complex and non-linear and kind of shifting and that adapts itself to, to very quickly changing realities? Um, <coughs> so basically, SAD is a non-profit organization based in Luxembourg. We're focusing on education and training in permaculture and transition. And um, basically what we do mostly is supporting the community uh, to enable kind of regenerative projects to come up. And um, our intention is to catalyze systemic transformation, which kind of is a very big term, so I'm not going to go into that. And, um, <laughs> and basic focus on culture. You know, culture is the way we do things and why we do them kind of habitually, which we don't really reflect often. And how do we actually make that uh, explicit in organization? And how do we create an organizational culture that is healthy and yeah, making people thrive and making environments thrive and all that? So basically, from the start, there was quite a lot of these kinds of metaphors of living systems going on in cell. So first, yeah, cell. Um, kind of semi-autonomous, semi-permeable unit of, you know, the most fundamental metabolic processes that are happening. And so basically my idea was that, you know, lots of little cells would come together and form an organism or whatever and actually collaborate and, the, you know, the liver wouldn't, you know, fight with the hearts and stuff like this. It would be amazing. And, um, yeah, the other thing would be, and I, I think the Quaker people touched on it in terms of self-similarity at different scales. There was uh, something about fractals that I found very interesting and how, and that these were ideas that then I was kind of looking at for the first time and kind of how at different scales, different, you know, the same kinds of issues emerged of how people could collaborate and how people could actually make changes and they had, you know, the same groups had conflicts and things like this. So we have the same issues happening at different scales and just because something is small, you know, like our, the bacteria in our gut, doesn't mean they're really hugely important. Um, yeah, and then the third idea or metaphor that <coughs> well, we live by is kind of the mycelium, which to me, when I first met it now, like, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I was like really frustrated that this wasn't on our kind of mainstream education. <laughs> when we're kind of five, we need to know this stuff, you know, about mycelium and how it, it connects things and how it um, is basically the underground transport system, and, and it kind of um, and you will see this kind of as I, as I go on. Um, yeah, that, that we are all, all connected into this ecosystem of communities and of the environments um, around that. So basically, that, these were the, the ideas. And then, um, <coughs> and now kind of as, as things were happening with Sal, it was very kind of exciting at the beginning. We were trying probably to, to do too many things and just kind of everything was like cool. We were just like, I yeah, do all kinds of things back, back at the beginning. And so, you know, slowly but surely, we needed to find some kind of processes to help us walk along this ridge um, between chaos and order, you know, where things were too fixed and things were maybe a little bit too chaotic. <laughs> um, and so basically, what we found very much, and I think this is, you probably realize this as well in, in your organizations, is that <coughs> These things don't happen in a linear fashion. It's very much a thing about discontinuous growth. Or oh, could I have a three minute warning, please? Nice. Um, uh, so basically, you know, at different stages, there are very much different forms or shapes 
there are different questions, and then kind of something happens, like attention, like James mentioned, and people respond to it and try to kind of, you know, how do we actually fit this in? Oh, we haven't actually thought about how we structure our, you know, processes, so, uh, or our payment for our courses, so we can actually include people. How do we actually do this? You know, so we create these things along the way as we, um, as we move along, and so a few years into, um, into growing cell. Um, we had our first kind of process of reflection, which was based on the question that's on the top there, and how do we create resilient systems um, by reconsidering our structure and our presence. So it was kind of about, you know, we're doing so many things, and what are we actually good at doing, or what do we actually want to focus on, you know? So it was kind of, and within that we, uh, we had an externally facilitated process within the, the core of cell and Everybody was invited to join in and to kind of, um, yeah, we came up with this vision and a mission and stuff, and also the values. And in the values, it was quite interesting that um, these are kind of, you know, when you look at them, they're very kind of spiritual values in, a, in some way, you know, which to me hadn't, you know, I, I didn't think that it was so widely shared in the course. So it was something surprising that came out, out of this process, for instance. And uh, we've, we flesh these out, uh, they're kind of, I think they're available on the website or if you're interested in them, I can, I can also talk to you more about this process. Uh, so basically, this is what came out of that and from there, you know, somehow things changed again. And yeah, we kind of made this like, we kind of encapsulated all our, um, you know, the permaculture principles and stuff into this kind of, volunteer guide so as to kind of keep the system open. So it wouldn't be this kind of cliquey thing of just a few friends that had come together sometime in 2010 or 11. You know, so, um, and we, and it's kind of thanks to Marco, I don't know if he's still here. I think it's might be gone. But um, basically we call them the mitochondria because they're the powerhouses of cells. So basically they're the kind of, you know, uh, these little structures that make respiration processes work and kind of transform all kinds of energy and do interesting things in cells. So that was one of the outcomes of this. I'm just kind of mentioning this. Um, but basically what this did was also to um, cater for self-organization. Um, because self-organization is something that happens naturally in um, living systems usually, but in our culture we're not so good at it. So we have to actually design it in. Yeah, I mean, and this is just a quote about, um, yeah, self-organization is just kind of, <coughs> when you developed as an embryo and we all, you know, it was all kind of happening and, you know, things came together and differentiated in a proper way, you know, it was pretty cool. Nobody was executing this. It was just kind of being, being formed from, a, like, I guess a, a combination of, uh, <coughs> yeah, genetic and then also developmental processes. But yeah, how do we actually design this in? At the beginning, had very naive ideas about self-organization and thought that, you know, autonomous leadership is going to evolve and it's going to be fine and these groups will be like. And so how do, how do we actually enable leadership? And I think that's something that uh, some of these uh, presentations uh, touched on and I think it's a very large <laughs> issue, so just bringing it up. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then ch things change again. Like 2013 and 2014, we saw lots of groups in, you know, this kind of strange uh, biome slash country that we have, um, <laughs> very small, and it's kind of there's a watershed kind of on this side, there's a watershed below, and then, you know, it's almost just one watershed. You know, it's really a bioregion, so it's interesting in that sense. And as there was all these groups that came up, there were thematic groups and, and regional groups, and uh, we put in a funding bid that was uh, going under the banner of Transition Platform Luxembourg in last year, and it was actually successful. So now we're kind of employing one person and two other people are being employed, and then we have our uh, year-long volunteers and that uh, come from uh, all over Europe. And uh, yeah, so there's, we're in this kind of very strange phase where things were partly professionalizing and there was different questions coming up about so we have this amazing, you know, celebratory culture that we have from our volunteers, but now we're aiming to professionalize. So how do we actually do that while, you know, having very, very much quality stuff in our courses and also 
um, providing services to local councils and kind of being in service relationships with different agencies, but also not really losing this kind of spirit. So that was like really new questions again. And um, yeah, and I kept moving along. So basically we went, uh, this kind of from the foot, like on the verge of that, we kind of created, we were already in governance process to kind of make explicit uh, the relationship between these things. And um, yeah, we, we were using sociocratic processes within the core but the action groups that you see kind of constellated around the core, um, you know, they kind of function how they want. And they, ha they are very different ecosystems, so they kind of, you know, some of them might be very, um, I don't know, just one guy saying, okay, this is how we do it, and others might be very different. But in the core, we wanted to have like actually very um, continuous processes. So basically, this this was how we how we functioned, but now with the, um, um, thank you, this, with the, with this Luxembourg uh, transition platform emerging, you know, it was like the first time last year that people started to think, okay, there's all these groups now, and now we're going to actually form something <coughs> entirely different, and how is that going to look? So basically, we are in the process of um, finishing this kind of new shape of things, um, and I'm not going to talk about that too much. Don't worry about it. It's, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I just wanted to... to uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, I just... I always pack too much in, and it's a problem. <coughs> I, I wanted to maybe just to round it off in a in a, in a kind of um, yeah. So basically, in terms of the social design, and this is part of one of my diploma designs that I did for the Permaculture Association UK, the di diploma. So basically, we have tools for collaboration, for decision making, making, and evolutionary visioning, which is I guess what James referred to as regular review of intention or something and community engagement. So these are all the things that, you know, are our ecosystem of um, how do we actually co do collaborate, you know, because we, we are these people who have grown up in a culture um, and who might fall back into these kind of patterns of, yeah, but, you know, we're different and we, yeah, I don't want to work with, yeah, all this kind of stuff. And so how do we actually make sure that, that this collaboration actually happens? So just as a... Um, um, I found this quote um, as a conclusion. Um, so when thinking about organization in this new way, um, there's this kind of very deep longing for wholeness, you know, that you can show up with all you are, you know, with all your brilliance and all your stupidity and all your silliness and all your kind of failings and history and whatever. And um, so I think this is kind of what gets me really excited about <laughs> this kind of thing and about permaculture and about you know, transition and about, you know, these new ways of bringing things from maybe outside of permaculture inside. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs>
organization, what group is most receptive or um, attracted to the KO or the ideas? Is it being young people or older people? Or? Well, that's a really interesting thing that I think tra transition brings and that Kramakashi can't do. You know, I'm kind of, at my heart, I, I discovered Kramakashi first, so I'm like, you know, very deeply loyal to whatever it is. And transition, I think it actually manages to be more inclusive and to not just attract perhaps um, a certain queen or, you know, by people that like to work, you know, outside and, I don't know. There's something about transition that is more inclusive and that attracts more people who are maybe united around uh, food or around their local neighborhoods or around diversity as such. You know, around the different linguistic communities, for instance, in Luxembourg. Um, yeah, so it's very diverse, actually. Very, and very diverse. Georgia itself, uh, is it more than transition down to the culture? The idea of the Georgia. Oh, well, the idea of chaotic, I just used it to, to speak about living systems and to speak about ways in which to understand organizations. So we didn't actually, there is a design process that is a, a chaotic design process, uh, which is here. It's a kind of, if you know the Luby's design web, it's a similar thing for organizations. It's very nonlinear, <coughs> and you can kind of form a collective purpose around it. So you can check that out, it's kind of also a tool that, that you can use, and we've used it just for one group. So we haven't used it to design the whole thing. Um, but yeah, we can, talk, we can talk about that after the talk. Um, more comment than a question really, but I've been in the PDCs I've been teaching over the years in terms of making projects happen. That was utterly remarkable because it means we're going to come in exactly on time. <laughs>